Peace everyone, Unmaskart here. Welcome to another Polishing Stage live stream. Hope everyone is having a fantastic week. Uh, this project here brought to you by the Art Club. We are just finishing this one up this week. Um, this is like a 12 part uh, tutorial. So if you're interested in learning this project, it is available over on the Art Club. Uh, I have a link for that in the description. Anyways, uh, I didn't quite finish it 100% this, this past week, or this past Tuesday. Um, still had a little bit of this leg here to finish off, and then I just wanted to adjust a few things uh, throughout the project before calling it 100% done. Hey there, Claire. Hi, Susan. Hello, Chandri. Good to see you. So anyways, I'm going to just jump right in to working on this and uh, finishing up the last little bits of details. And as usual, if you have any questions, I'm always happy to take your questions. So feel free to ask as many as you, if, as many as you want. Hello, bonjour. Welcome. Like I said, I've been working on this one for a few weeks now. It's uh, broken up into about 10, 11 different parts and used a variety of pastel techniques. But mainly we used uh, the Carbothello pastel pencils and several of the art club members actually used the pastel pencils for the entirety, including the background. Uh, I, however, I used masking film first off to cover the castle and to cover, cover the characters. And I used soft pastels for the sky, the mountains, the trees, and the grass. but totally not necessary. You can get away with this whole project just using the set of Carbothello pastel pencils. Thank you. I'm glad you like the way that it looks. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun with this project. Howl's Moving Castle is one of my all-time favorite movies, um, and I had just watched it. I had just watched it recently, and... Oh, I'm trying to remember who who came up with the idea of doing it as a project, but um, the, the, funny enough, it, it wasn't me. I just I just happened to, you know, have to go on a Miyazaki movie marathon, and like a day later, I think I mentioned the movie or something, and somebody recommended doing a Ghibli Studios inspired project and this was one of the uh, screenshots from the movie that they recommended and I was like uh, yeah if you want to do that I, I want to do that too and so uh, started the project and here we are about ready to finish it up and this has been for sure one of my favorite just art projects in general that I've that I've done in a long long time uh, partly because the style is just so gorgeous um, absolutely love the style of the art in uh, Miyazaki's movies they're just they're just so expressive and and fun and um, you know generally I stick to realism and uh, doing something more cartoony and looser is always a fun challenge for myself. And so doing this project was a good, a good learning experience and very relaxing for me. Oh, 
Oh, hi there, Alicia. Yeah, I'm glad you were able to catch a live stream. Time to switch up colors. A little bit of green. Hey there, Diane. Good to see you. So also one of the other projects that uh, we started on this week in the art club is a graphite portrait. That's a, another fun project. Just started this past Wednesday. Uh, next Monday, We'll be starting a new pastel project. I haven't quite decided on the reference for the next pastel project. Um, kind of sticking to the theme of uh, anime, I was going to do a, a scene from the Ghost in the Shell movie that involved some buildings because uh, I haven't I haven't really touched architecture or buildings or cityscapes in any way and so i thought that'd be kind of a cool way to incorporate some buildings into the next project um and i was looking through the movie and trying to find a the exact scene that i was envisioning for the project but didn't quite see what i was uh remembering when I was discussing the idea. So may it may change up that idea for the next pastel project. Uh, how long does it take to complete this? Um, so this is the 12th session. Uh, most of the sessions are right around an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, I think there was a couple sessions that were less than an hour, maybe like 40, 50 minutes. Um, so if I if I round it out to sort of guess, um, I'd say maybe around 12 hours, you know, given that I generally do about an hour per session. And today is, today is actually the, the 12th session um, but I know there was a couple sit downs where it was like two hours long so just sort of uh, guessing but yeah about, about 12 hours I think and I actually sort of discovered like a newish technique idea uh, in particular with the characters here uh, I mean as you can see they, they just look like they're totally animated right the nice bold lines and uh, something that i've that i've done a really really long time ago was incorporating ink into pastel work but the way that i had used it way back in the day is uh, actually with a private lesson um, i had a student that wanted to do this tree uh, and it was like a really dark silhouette of a tree. And then it was just super colorful everywhere. But she wanted to do it with pastels. And she was, she just asked me, you know, how, how would you approach this piece? Uh, considering the, the tree is black. It's just a black solid silhouette of a tree, really unique branches and everything and perspective. It was kind of like looking up at the tree so the branches were all around and um, before 
this was a couple years ago, by the way. Uh, before the lesson, I had already started experimenting with the use of ink and pastels because I wanted to first test ink and how it worked on the pastel mat, which is the surface that I always work on with pastels and the only surface that I recommend. And uh, pastel mat, it doesn't really like ink that much partially due to the fact that it's very absorptive. And so when you apply ink to the pastel mat, it can feather a lot. You, you, you can get quite a lot of feathering. But uh, in spite of that, ink does work okay. Um, you know, I'd say on a scale of one to 10, you're probably looking at about six and a half or a seven. As far as like the quality of lines that you can capture, with ink just to do purely due to the, the feathering. And so I was already I was already toying around with that when my student asked me about this particular tree project that she wanted to replicate. And so I uh, I told her, you know, about using ink in combination. And the the, the other thing that I had tested was uh, how the pastels work over top of the ink so say you, you know you lay down some ink and you try to apply the pastel over top of it um, the thing is the the ink actually repels to a degree the pastel so if you've ever if you've ever used uh, wax crayons on paper and then tried to apply watercolor over top of it you'll notice that the watercolor won't a stick to the waxy part that you apply the crayon to. Um, and ink and pastel, they have a very similar relationship, though it's not as um, pastel phobic, um, the ink, as, as crayons are aquaphobic. And so there's a, a little bit of leeway there as far as the ink still showing through, even though you apply pastel right over top of it. And so what we decided to, to do with the, the tree project was just do the tree entirely in black ink and then throw all the color we wanted in the, the picture as far as the leaves go with pastels. And it actually worked uh, quite well. And so remembering that, what I decided to do with the characters is do this bold outlining with ink and then simply just fill in the space with the uh, pastel pencils and it and it worked like a charm and you can see the result just looks fantastic like it it just looks like a cartoon and it you get those nice clean outlines uh, the color is nice and flat inside um, and uh, it just looks really good and you know it was a bit of an experiment because though I had previously tested the use of ink in combination with pastels. Um, I wasn't sure how good of a result I would get until uh, I finally just uh, decided to go for it because I was toying around with the idea for a couple days of, you know, just using the pastels, not just trying to get the best outline that I could with the, the black pastel as opposed to using ink. But I'm super pleased with uh, the way it came together with the ink and uh, the result I was so happy with. Uh, I want to I want to do more projects in this in this similar style. Um, I really like the Spirited Away, Kiki's Delivery Service. Um, those are other movies that I really like, and um, so I, I might do another project in the future similar to this and using that ink outline for the characters and whatnot just to get characters that look like that on the page because it just looks so good. Oh, hey there, Gila. Good to see you. Marcy, well. Oh, okay, Diane. Well, I'm glad you're getting uh finally getting a chance to to see the movie
my black pencil. Oh goodness, I had just enough, just enough of my black pencil. I'm still waiting for uh, my um, art supplies to be delivered. And I didn't realize that I was out of my black carbothello, uh, carbothello um, until it was too late. And I was trying to sharpen this one final time. And I actually never realized this. Um, so I never really look at the back of the pencils, but uh, the core of the carbothello pencils actually stops about right here about a centimeter from the actual end. So the core doesn't go to this end. It actually stops here. And so since this pencil is so sharp, uh, so sharp, uh, so short, uh, I actually, uh, when I was sharpening it about 20 minutes ago, the core of the pencil came out. I was like, what in the heck? And I saw that it was only, it's, it, it stops like right here. And so I had to super glue it back into the wood of the pencil and I can't sharpen it anymore because uh, it's it's just an absolute nub of a core of a pencil that stops like right here. So it's just barely being held on by a little bit of super glue that technically is still drying. So I gotta be super delicate with it. But um, I ordered like five five black pencils, uh, and hopefully they'll you know they'll be here in in the next in the next couple days or whatnot. But I had just barely enough to finish this project because you can see how much black there is here. Uh, who is my favorite character in Howl's Moving Castle? Um, I don't know, I'm kind of a sucker for Scarecrow, for Turnip, Turnip Head, but um, Oh, I can't remember. Um, what's the fire's name? The fire demon? Um, uh, what is it? What is his name? It's like I can... It's one of those times where you like have the word, but you can't say it. Um, oh, gosh darn it. I just, I just heard his name like yesterday, too. Oh goodness! Somebody, somebody, help me out there. But I, I think it might be the fire. The fire demon is just funny. It, every time, uh, Calcifer. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, especially the part where like Sophie isn't really paying attention and he almost goes out. It's just so. It's just so funny. You know. You, uh, the characterization of of quite literally a fire is just so well done and it's funny it makes me laugh every time and it's adorable like how do you make fire adorable like that doesn't even seem like it's a it's a possible object to make adorable but somehow somehow they end up making fire adorable and just the uh, the sounds and everything that the calcifer makes and his his uh expressions are really really funny too also um uh the queen's dog i can't remember his name <laughs> but I love the Queen's dog also. Um forgetting everybody's forgetting everybody's name. But um Yeah, that's another one of my favorite characters in the in the movie. The the funny thing is my favorite characters aren't aren't the main characters. The dog makes me laugh too. Funny noises and the uh, expressive nature of the dog. I 
I'm just glad you didn't ask me what Howl's Moving Castle is about. <laughs> My favorite character is an easy answer, but um, explaining what the movie is about that one's that one's a little little bit harder because I don't even think I could really explain it. One of the things that I like about the movie so much is the meaning is the meaning isn't doesn't even feel like the point of the movie, you know? It it more or less just it just feels like something. It's kind of like um a classical uh, film. I, f I forget what they call them. I I took a an Italian film appreciation class when I was in college. Uh, and some of the stories or some of the explanations for the purpose of the movies was not not linear storytelling. It was more of a it was more of like a lived experience as opposed to telling some kind of coherent story. And I, I feel like House Moving Castle is a lot like that as well. It's not it's not this just here's the story that you can follow. It's more of like a series of events that happen to the characters and you simply you simply just live the characters' experiences. Forget what they call that in film. It's been a long time since since I've uh, taken a film class, but Alrighty, well, I think that that leg is done. Looks good. I'm just going to continue on doing some polishing. I got a few things up here that I feel like I need to just bring in some color, smooth it out a little bit maybe, and better. Yeah, that that seems uh, seems like a good way to describe it, like a slice of life. Yeah. Yeah, very very interesting slice of life with uh, with Hal's moving castle. But I mean, what really makes the movie good is the visuals and the music. The story is, the story just is a total sideline. With with a lot of Miyazaki's movies, it it's more about the work of art as opposed to the story that it that you pull from it. The ambiguity of the potential meanings. Is a bit, a bit Shakespearean, but the visuals and music is where I feel like the real story is being told.
add some color variation to this leg. It's just a bit, bit plain. Again, let me just reiterate that if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, I never, I never get asked too many questions. So if you have multiple questions, uh, you are more than welcome to ask every single one of them. The more, the more questions you ask, the better for everybody, including myself. Oh, hey there, Noelani. Good to see you. I feel like it's been quite some time. Uh, thank you, Ayat. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. But yeah, I, I try, try my best to interact with, uh, with all of you the best that I can. Sometimes I can get distracted and forget to look at chat, but generally I do my best. I mean, that's why I do it, after all. Um, I, I could simply just finish this project jamming out to my favorite music. But I'd much rather do it as a live stream and get to meet new people and chat and answer questions. I think that's probably what I like to do more is just answer questions of people have for me as opposed to uh, actually the drawing, coloring, or painting aspect of the live stream. If there is if there is a question that I have an answer for, then I'm excited to share that information with as many people as I can. Because if people find it helpful, then I mean that's just that's just fantastic. Uh, yes, John, I do live in Poland. Uh, I've lived in Poland for uh, six years. I'm going to add a little bit of spicy orange into some of these glowing spots on the castle. Uh, and for those of you that have been working on this project along with me in the art club, uh, this is actually a new color. This is 215 that I'm using. Um, and I just pulled this color out because it's a, a brighter orange that I wanted to sprinkle in to the project to give it a little bit more saturation.
Hello, Crafty Arts. Uh, how is my Polish? Um, I haven't studied the language at all, so I don't I don't speak Polish at all. I think maybe a uh, maybe eventually I will dedicate the time and effort into learning the language, but I have yet to. I have made a couple short-lived attempts at learning the language. I did, I actually, I took Polish when I was in college for a, for, for one a uh, quarter and it was it was less than ideal uh f in terms of learning the the inv learning environment the teaching process wasn't very conducive to my peculiar learning style And so I didn't get much out of that. And then I also took a, uh, I took Polish here in Poland. I, I did a, a training course at one of the local language schools. Um, and it was so atrociously bad that um one day i just went in and i said i'm done uh this is this is horrible i'm i'm learning absolutely nothing and the way you guys are teaching this is just idiotic it was a giant waste of money it's very disappointed cuz i i spent like i don't know 6 or 7 weeks I did half of the course, did half of the course, and I had absolutely nothing to show for it. I went in, I took notes, I studied vocabulary, um, but uh, the the entire experience was me. You know, I, I tolerated the class. It was just it was something that I tolerated because it was so poorly organized. Um, but I would go in and they just, they would just talk at you. Like they, they, at no point was there any actual communication between the educator and the people trying to learn. You would just go in and they'd talk to you in Polish and nothing is ever explained. They just sit there and talk to you. And it's like, I could, I could go turn on the TV and get this experience. You're you're doing nothing but frustrating me. So that was my that was my brief experience trying to learn the language at a local language school. And um, from that point, I just kind of put it on the back burner. And that was a few years ago. I've tried to get my wife to uh, help the learning process, but you know, as as English as her third language, she wants to just use that, practice that. And of course, she's at work all day, so the last thing she wants to do is come home and have to talk to her husband like a child in Polish. Um, 
So I just, yeah, I just put it on the back burner for now. But maybe one day. Maybe one day it will be a top priority, but right now it's just not. Uh, maybe each week uh, practice Polish phrases. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know about that. I have I have sort of thought about like incorporating Polish into my everyday life. You you would think it's it'd be easy. I live in Poland, but um, the reality is I don't get out much. I barely ever leave my flat, and when I do leave my flat. I can assure you I'm not talking to strangers. Not really ever talking to anybody. I think that's probably the 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 most difficult part of trying to learn the language is that if I'm to practice the language I I don't I just don't have somebody on a regular basis to practice with and you know when my my wife is gone all day at work I'm not looking to practice my Polish when I finally get to see her at the end of the day it's not really that's not my priority at the end of the day cuz it's not fun practicing my Polish with my wife I can that's just if it was, it, I'd probably already speak the language fluently, but asking asking my wife questions on how to say things in Polish is, um, well, honestly, I, I feel like she'd enjoy me pulling her teeth out more than that. Because to be honest with you, it'd be easier. It'd be easier to to pull her teeth out than it is to get an answer regarding Polish from her. Because <laughs> I've tried. I've tried getting some Polish instruction from my wife, but it's, uh, it's not easy. I think... You know, my biggest motivating factor to learning Polish actually is just to be able to communicate with my mother-in-law because she doesn't speak any English at all. And um, she's great. She's great. And I'd love to just have a conversation with her. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day. Uh, is there a way to learn perspective without knowing all the terms? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first off, uh, there's not very many terms with perspective in the first place. Uh, if you can, you need two terms. You need horizon line and vanishing point. Everything else is irrelevant. Two terms. Uh, and if you can't remember horizon line and vanishing point, then you probably won't ever be able to draw perspective. Um, but those two terms is all you need. You need to not just know those, you know, know those words. You need to know what they represent. Just those two things, and um, you'll be in good shape with your journey on learning perspective. But perspective can be learned practically as well, but you have to practice efficiently uh, or effectively. So that's that's something that you 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 may need to overcome. If if perspective is throwing you for a loop, then perhaps you're just not practicing in a way that works for your learning style or whatnot. Because I actually I I learned perspective. I learned perspective when I was about nine years old. Um, I had this 
hobby that I never really grew out of. But one of the things that I liked to do was learn random skills. And uh, I still sort of do that. Uh, and one of, one of the things that I did when I was still in elementary school is I'd go to the library and I just find books that teach you stuff. And one of the, th one of the books that I got was a book on perspective and I just learned how to draw like cubes and buildings in perspective using one point and two point perspective. And, um, I, I don't think it was until like high school or maybe late middle school or something that I learned about three point perspective, but, um, yeah, I learned that when I was like nine, ten years old from a book, just random book that I found in the school library. I just go there and look at uh, look at random books, and I found one on perspective. And when I was uh, when I was ten, I'd already been drawing for about four years. I started drawing when I was six, um, and when I say started drawing, I don't mean the way kids generally draw. I was drawing with the conscious effort of getting better. It was something that I that I actively practice when I was six years old, not nearly as diligently as I do as an adult, or certainly not as diligently as I did uh, like in high school. But it was something that I was aware of that I wanted to get good at. And so it was something that I did at least weekly. So, you know, it was, it was something that I felt I did a lot uh, as a child. And so learning, uh, learning perspective was sort of uh, an accidental discovery stemmed purely from uh, discovering this random book in the school library. I can still even remember some of the pictures from that book, but um, I, I remember the uh, the one point perspective picture was of the inside of a spaceship, and uh, I recall drawing that one, practicing that one point perspective, and then uh, moving to two point perspective on like just random buildings, and I remember I drew I drew a train station like in the desert and I use the, uh, you know, I use the right vanishing point for the railroad tracks kind of coming like this. And I drew like a, this train station just in the middle of the desert with some mountains in the back and, you know, just very basic stuff, utilizing the rules of perspective and in particular one point perspective and just building a, understanding of vanishing points and how uh, those vanishing points manipulate the uh, the horizontal lines that create cubes uh, so cubes was something that i just you know you build a house you just start with cubes that's your building block and uh, all of the lines just go to the vanishing points and it's relatively simple from from there and then uh, later on, maybe maybe middle school, something like that, is when I did a bit more perspective practice, and I learned how to do like ellipses and circles in perspective. Uh, circles are also quite easy to learn, but uh, you know, not everything is is a cube. So, uh, how do you do? How do you draw a car in perspective when a car has wheels? And so being able to draw uh, circles in perspective, also that are referred to as ellipses, because ellipses are just circles in perspective. And uh, so I discovered how to do that and just 
continue to build my understanding over the years. It, it, perspective is not something that I ever spent a lot of time on. It was just something that I learned in the background as I focused on what I really wanted to draw, which was always just people. But perspective is certainly a skill that I highly recommend every artist at least build a decent foundation on because, um, you know, getting into landscapes or really anything, even, even drawing people, perspective can come into play if you want to do creative camera angles. Like say you're drawing a person from like a really steep camera angle looking up at them. Then you have to understand how uh, that, that angle is going to affect the perspective and the foreshortening of, of body parts. And so um, it, at the end of the day, it, it will always benefit you to know how to do perspective. And it, it doesn't just help you in, in your drawing and art. It helps you in your thinking. Yeah, because if you, if you can't think it, then you can't draw it. And uh, if you don't, I mean, honestly, if you, if you can't think it, then you, you just can't do it. Period. You can't, you can't think it. You can't visualize it. You can't visualize it. You can't speak it. If you can't speak it, you can't do it. So uh, just developing a small, tiny, minuscule foundation of understanding how perspective can be represented on a two-dimensional surface uh, can go a long way, can go much farther than you can, well, than you can think simply because if you don't understand it, you can't think it, then you have no idea how much it can benefit you. Because one, one of the things that I think it probably helped me develop partially due to the fact that I learned it so young and I taught it to myself just from a book, I just grabbed a random book that taught me how to do it, um, is that I think it may have played a, a significant role in my ability to visualize things in my head now. Because uh, one of the things that I can do when I, when I think of objects in my head is that even if I can't see the other side of it, I can spin it in my head and draw it from any angle. Um, and uh, an example of this is like an elephant. Like I don't have a reference of an elephant in front of me, but I can picture an elephant quite vividly in my head, just standing there, maybe not doing anything in particular, just standing there. But I can also take that elephant, I can look at it from whatever angle, whatever vantage point that I want, and I can just move it in my head like a, like a, CG computer, you know, object, like a three-dimensional object that you might see in Blender or something. And I can just spin that in my head and see it from every angle. And I think that's a, I know that's a unique skill to be able to do because when I told my wife this, she's like, how can you do that? And well, the, the reality is I have no idea how I can do it. It's just, I can do that in my head with any object that I can create a clear picture of. I can just move it in any way. And I think that it, it stems from possibly learning perspective very early and being able to do that with simple objects first, like a cube. I can just draw a cube from any perspective, no matter what, because I can just take a cube and think about it in my head and spin it any way that I want and just draw exactly what that cube looks like from any vantage point.
So just sort of reiterates um, the potential benefit of learning such things. And you, you never really know how far that basic information can take you. Anyways, that's a, that's a great question and an even longer answer. But I hope that you found it. I hope you found the information uh, useful. Because you, you basically asked a yes or no question. And I gave you a 15-minute rant. I am about to uh, finish this up, by the way. Just gonna add a little bit of purple and orange into the mountains. And then I will officially call this project done and I will untape it. Untape the border and then you can, get, you, you can all see what it finally looks like as a finished project. Anyways, I hope that you guys have enjoyed today's live stream. Uh, if you did, you know, feel free to give it a thumbs up. I always appreciate that. I believe the, what is it, Monday? Monday is the last day of August. So that means next Friday, I will be doing the live critiques. Um, so if you have, you know, any projects that worked on and you'd love to give, uh, get my, my feedback, I'll be doing a live stream next Friday as well. And if you're wondering where to submit your projects for the live critiques, uh, make sure you join the Facebook group a link for that is also in the description. I'll be posting the thread for the live critique uh, sometime next week, probably maybe even Monday or Tuesday. And uh, so you'll want to look out for that post and then you simply share it in the comments and then show up to the live stream. And I will critique your art, give you my honest feedback and hopefully help you improve on whatever it is you're currently working on. Just as you asked that question, Susan, yes, indeed.
Alrighty. Well, I am going to call this project complete. So allow me to zoom out a touch and then untape the border so you guys can see it in its entirety. Uh, which project took the longest so far? Um, not too long ago, we finished up a still life project, and I did a I did a polishing stage live stream for that as well. So if you go back like I don't know maybe two months, um, you'll find a live stream very similar to this one where I'm doing the polishing stage of a still life project. And to this day, uh, that is the longest live streamed project that uh, that I've ever done. Uh, I think it was like 16 sessions, but I know that several of those sessions, like four or five of them were two, two and a half hours long because um, it was a large detailed project, not too different than this one. But um, this one went by a bit quicker because I did the background and all of this with soft pastel, which takes far less time than pastel pencil. Got to be delicate taking the tape off. Don't want to ruin the project now, right? It's just about just about be complete. No no pastel project is totally complete till the tape comes off. Cuz as long as it has this nasty tape border, it always looks unfinished. And then when you reveal the nice crisp clean border it just looks a thousand times better. One last piece of tape here. Alrighty, and there we have it. This is uh, definitely one of my favorite projects for sure. I wish I had walls that I could hang framed pictures on because I think that of all the projects that I've done, getting this one framed and hung on my wall would be definitely up there in the list of projects to uh, do that with. And I'm I'm glad it's I'm glad it's finally done because now with the nice clean borders it just pops off the page so well right just looks so much better with the without the taped borders so anyways let me uh, again just thank everyone for coming by and hanging out and all of the art club members that went through the process with me hope that you enjoyed this project as much as I did. I love the colors in this in this project. It's just so fun. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you learned a lot following along on this project as well as enjoyed it. And for everyone else, um, you know, go join the art club. Link for it is in the description. And I will see you all next time. Enjoy the rest of your week. Have a great weekend. Take care. Peace.